um, my, my background was kind of uh, culturally uh, Jewish. Um, so we had like uh, a, lot, a lot of the traditions with us, like, uh, you know, Passover, Hanukkah, and then I got accepted into a music college. That's where I knew Adele from. And then um, she basically messaged me and said, do you want to kind of play, put my own kind of music collective together in, uh, in South London, based in South London, um, mm-hmm. around like Brixton um, area. And we started to become more successful. Um, we were recording, we started being played on like one extra. And also we were very uh, close with uh, someone called KTB. So he, 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 I saw the... Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Brothers and sisters, how are you guys doing? Really excited for today's podcast with what brother Louis slash Ismail uh, Who used to be a Zionist Jew um, And he was also the drummer for Adele Atkins And some other music artists and was on tour with them, quite heavily involved, deep in the music industry. And then he left music and Judaism, accepted Islam. And now, you know, Allah Mubarak, he's abroad, seeking knowledge, working, studying, providing for his family, doing the whole shebang. So I thought, inshallah ta'ala, you guys can really benefit from this episode. So, bi-idhni Allah ta'ala, without any further ado, let's start the podcast. Peace. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, welcome back to another episode of MXP, the Muslim Experience Podcast. Today, alhamdulillah, we got brother, uh, Louis or Louis? How, how would you, how was the correct way to pronounce it? Louis or Ismail. Louis or Ismail. Louis is my, okay. like, my birth name. Um, uh-huh. That was the name that I kind of chose when I became okay. okay. Mashallah, Be- beautiful. Oh wow, it's actually interesting that you chose Ismail. Okay, we're gonna come to it. We're gonna come to it. Inshallah, to Allah. people will know what I'm talking about in a bit. So, brother, brother, brother Ismail Sharp or Louis Sharp, uh, and Mashallah, brother Ismail is a revert to Islam. Uh, he came from Judaism, from a Zionist Jewish background, and he came to Islam. Um, and not only that, he was actually a musician and he was the drummer for Adele Atkins, who's the famous musician that many of you guys uh, you know, may have heard of. And he was on tour with her, drumming with her. And today, inshallah ta'ala, we're gonna speak with the brother and discuss his story coming out of uh, this Judaic secular, uh, sorry, Judaic uh, Zionist background into Islam and also his journey of how he went through some of the lowest points in his life, seeing some of the evils of the music industry um, being on tour with Adele and things after that And then eventually finding Al-Islam To now, you know, mashallah being Ismail <laughs> Allah mabarik How you doing Habibi? How's things? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Akhi, I'm, I'm good Nah, I'm good Mashallah, mashallah well, It's an absolute pleasure to have you here Thank you so much for taking out your time You know, I know you're you're pressed uh, with work and everything So inshallah ta'ala Habibi, we'll go straight into it So um, first and foremost, I think we'll talk. About, we'll start the story chronologically. We'll start it from the beginning, inshallah ta'ala. So you are Ismail. You're born to a a uh, uh, um, you know to to a Jewish mother, and I believe Christian father. Um, yeah, and, loosely uh, Christian culturally, you know, Christian culturally, yeah, and Jewish. Also, you mentioned it was quite. It was like a cultural Judaism. It wasn't an actual like religious Judaism. Uh, um, yeah, so basically, um, uh, as I said, um, my, my background was kind of uh, culturally uh, Jewish. Um, so we had like uh, a, lot, a lot of the traditions with us, like, uh, you know, Passover, Hanukkah. Bar Mitzvah. All that stuff. Um, it's all of that kind of stuff. So when I got a bit older, I started going to the synagogue on Saturdays, just as a kind of cultural attachment. Um, but you know, in UK, most people are kind of on upon the religion of uh, secular liberalism. You know, so uh-huh. that was kind of that aqidah aspect of growing up. But obviously, culturally, it was uh, it was Jewish, and that was attached to. Um, like uh, the Zionist ideology, really, like the importance of establishing the state of Israel 
uh, as a place for the the Jews to to be safe, you know, uh-huh. as it were. So, so Habibi, you know, just 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 before we um, progress, inshallah, I think it's important for us to just clarify the meanings of certain terms for people, uh, because like there's, I know some 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 Muslims uh, they don't understand, for example, the difference between Judaism being being a Jew and being an Israeli and also being a Zionist. And I also not feel like, you know, from the Zionist community, they like to intentionally, uh, you know, you know, I don't know about intentionally, but there's, there's, there's something that I see from them is that they, they, they kind of conf- conflate the things that we say. For example, we might be talking about Judaism and then they conflate it with, with the, with, with, with the Israeli or the Israeli race, do you see? So um, could, could you first and foremost just kind of defi- like help us understand what each of these things are? Inshallah. So what's a Zionist? What's an Israeli? And what's a Yehudi? What's a Jew? Okay, so yeah, this can be uh, a bit confusing for people um, uh, because uh, Judaism is like a comb, it's like a people, um, it's like a bloodline, as it were, and it's also an a, a, a creed, a creed. You see, yeah. so um, for example, my uh, my upbringing was kind of attached to the fact that I'm like ethnically Ashkenazi Jewish, European Jew on my mother's uh-huh. side. So Ashkan, uh, what was that term? Sorry? Ash, Ash, Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, and that means European Jew. That's European Jew. Okay, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. The, the the Jews from Europe, Austria, Hungary, Austria, Hungary, Poland, yeah, yeah. Germany. Um, and there's the Sephardic Jews, which are from uh, like North African, you know, the Yemeni, some of the Yemeni Jews. And, ah, I see. I see. Afro Asiatic Jews. You see. So okay. my my background is from Europe. You see. So. Uh-huh. Um, uh, my my on my mother's side family came from like Poland, Austria, Hungary in the 1920s to like um, East London. You know, Brick Lane, Whitechapel. There's okay. a bigger like, working class Jewish community there. So yeah, basically there's there's Judaism like as a as a comb, as a people, like as a bloodline, um, and then there's the actual you know like uh, Akida aspect of it. You see, and then there's Zionism, which you could even say is like a separate thing because you can have non-Jewish Zionists, pro-Zionists. You could be a Christian and be a Zionist. You could be a an atheist and be a Zionist. Exactly. I mean, like uh, you've got these, um, for example, these Orthodox they call them the Haredi Jews that are against the state of Israel. For example, they're Orthodox uh, Jew, Jews by Aqidah and by blood. Um, yet they're not they're not pro-Zionist. You see. Okay. So it's quite it's quite confusing, and as you said, the whole thing gets conflated. So you have like a, a someone who is like a secular Jew, for example, like Noam Chomsky or um, Finkelstein, who they 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 condemn the atrocities that are happening in the so-called state of Israel, um, and they're labelled as um, self-hating Jews, you know, by the Zionist regime. Uh, okay. You see, but they might actually even associate with some of the traditions of Judaism, but because they're speaking against Zionism. And the the things that are going on in uh, in in uh, Palestine, um, yeah. they're condemned by the 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 agenda, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I th- I think I think it's very important for us Muslims, especially who speak um, out and find trouble with the Zionist ideology, to know the difference between these things. Because many a time we get pigeonholed, we get banned, we get shut down for speaking out against Zionism, and sometimes even responding to Judaism, the religion. And they conflate it with us being racist, and they say we're anti, uh, 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 we're anti Semites, and obviously Semite is like another term for the race. And you know, to us, the, the Israeli race, the Israeli race. I'm not talking about the Israeli state, but the Israeli race, the Banu Israel. Well, like some of the most beloved people to us are Israeli, and we don't have a problem, uh, um, you know, with the race. What we take issue with is the creed. The creed and the creed is either either Judaic or it's Zionist. Do you see? Because of course, all disbelief, all forms of disbelief, is ultimately what Islam takes trouble with. Islam is a religion that is monotheistic uh, in in all aspects. You know, we believe there is only one Lord, and we also only worship that one Lord, and we follow the Sunnah of His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the and the Salaf al-Salih to follow. So, so anyone who who goes against that. Uh, that's we're always going to have issue with that, and that's where our discussions are going to be. But it's not fair that every time we bring up a discussion about Zionism and Judaism, we get held back. Oh, you're anti-Semitic. Oh, oh, you, 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 you hate Israel. You hate Israelis, and you're race basically racist. Because to be anti-Semitic would be racist. 
it's like it's like hating it's like hating anyone from any race you know it's like yeah it's like hating an arab and i also think that muslims to some extent might have fallen into a bit of an extreme here like for example israel is a beautiful name but who would call their son israel now israel is the name of yaqub yaqub alayhi salam is the is the grandson of ibrahim alayhi salam he's the father of many of the prophets that came after you know in the, in the quran when you hear banu israel you're talking about the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12, the 12 sons of Ya'qub. Ya'qub had 12 sons, Yusuf being one of them, Benjamin, Benjamin being one of them. He had 12 sons, each one of them went on to have their own tribe. So Israel is a beautiful name. There were even Imams from the Salaf. I think one called Israel ibn Ishaq. You know, Israel is a beautiful name. And we don't have a problem with someone being Israeli. It's because you could be Israeli as you are, Sheikh, and you're a Muslim. You see? Or you could be an Israeli and you could be a Kafir. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions that they were disbelievers from amongst Banu Israel because not all of them were always disbelievers. Wow. Yeah, this Afro is what I, I wanted to touch, touch on that point, Aki, that you, that you mentioned about the Muslims need to be aware of this because recently someone, uh, an Arab brother, uh, commented on um, a video that I did and he said, um, Yahudi yabqa Yahudi la usaddiquka. A Jew, a Jew remains a Jew. I don't believe you. So we went back and forth. I was, I, was, uh, I messaged him back. I was like, I need to correct this, you know, because this is a mis, mis, uh, what do you call it? A mis, um, misinformation. I said, listen, uh, if someone, because he brought up the issue of uh, Ibn Sabah, you see, the, 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 the Yahudi who, um, the, the head of the Shias and the Khawarij. Khawarij. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he said, you know, how do I know you're not this guy? Uh, and I said, okay, yeah, well, yeah. what about uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, the the rabbi who uh, took shahada in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Allah 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 Allah. Um, so I said, listen, uh, it's not, you know, your 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 blood does not is not connected to your aqidah. Yeah, you see, your blood is not connected to your aqidah. The difference between Abdullah ibn Saba. And uh, Abdullah ibn Salam was their aqidah, not their dumb, not their blood, you see. Mm. So um, he had this preconception that if you are just Jewish by ethnicity, you're by default a jasus or, you know, a spy or, you know, honest. So alhamdulillah, we went back and forth and he he acknowledged that and he apologized. So, um, you know, I could I could see it was a khata. It was a, it was a mistake that I, I wanted to invest in it because I saw he's a Muslim brother and this is something that I think some some Muslims may have this idea so yeah. as you were mentioning about the aqidah aspect of it you have to yeah. differentiate between ethnicity i'tiqad um, and, you ideology. Know, and ideology exactly yeah now. yeah yeah, no barakal of So just, just no, just for sharing that. So just to summarize for people. So Israel is the race, i.e., you know, being Semitic. Judaism is a religion, even though nowadays Judaism is con conflated between the race and the religion. But it's when when we Muslims have to make clear when we talk about Judaism, we talk about the religion, not the race, because that's how you can inshallah ta'ala stay out of trouble. And then Zionism, you don't even have to be a Jew, <laughs> you know, or an Israeli. To be Zionist, Zionism is just the ideology that believes in the state of Israel and it's and 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 all of the stuff that we see today manifesting on a global level with regards to Israel. That's basically where Zionist comes into place, so like a political kind of ideology. Barakallah fi Sheikh. There's there's another aspect as well, Achi, which is um the Ashkenaz people of Europe. There's there's um there's a book I read a while ago called The 13th Tribe. It's written by Ashkenazi Jew. Um, okay. Uh, and it's about basically a question mark over if the Ashkenaz are really eth ethnically from Ben Israel, you see. Oh, wow, really? Brought, there's quite a lot of um, Islamic sources uh, in, in, this, uh, in this book. Many, many Jews will say this is a, um, because the, the, the right wing and the, the neo-Nazis basically use that book uh, for their own kind of agendas. So they say, oh, no, this book is like an anti-Semitic um, you know, a text. However, it was written by a, an Ashkenazi Jew who was obviously not a neo-Nazi. Uh, he's bringing his his argument, backing it up with uh, with uh, Adilla. Uh, so there there is a question mark there, you know. So I don't know how much I can say I'm actually ethnically from uh, Benu Israel, you know. But uh -huh. as much, what I do know is that my family came from Europe and they associated themselves to to Jewry, to Judaism, and they were dif different ethnically. Uh, they're a different ethnic group, but Allah knows best how 
uh, how much that relates back to Ben Israel. You see, so uh-huh. that, that's an important discussion that needs to be had. But if you bring that up, you'll probably just be called like a, an anti anti Semite. So oh, really? it has to be, uh, <laughs> yeah. Has to position it correctly. <laughs> yeah, you have to position it correctly and do it academically. And, um, you know, but as you said, like you can say, you can say the most unassuming of things and be uh, called an anti Semite. So there's, yeah. a, there's an agenda to play here. You know, no, I, I think this is so is, 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 is very enlightening so far. I feel like a lot of people are like, they, they, they're getting, they're getting, um, what's the word, enlightened. Um, so inshallah, ta'ala, let's 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 come to your story now and your journey, inshallah. Ta'ala. So, you um mentioned that you know, being young, you um, you kind of you know, felt quite attached to your Judaic uh, Israeli kind of culture. Uh, from the angle of your mum, and you kind of, you know, then went down that road. So, 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 tell us about your journey, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah. So, um, yeah. When I was about, uh, do you want me to talk about the music thing or the the Judaism thing, or kind of mix it together? So we'll mix it. We'll try our best to mix it together, inshallah ta'ala. So maybe tell us about your early years, your relationship with the drum kit, and your also your relationship with Judaism, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> yeah. So, so obviously, um, you know, there was the cultural Judea. Uh, Jewish background, and then uh, my real kind of uh, dean, my real kind of passion was uh, music. So I got into music very, very young. You know, like I grew up in a house where my parents were from the kind of like punk and reggae generation. Okay. You know, so they had all these records and stuff. So I kind of grew up listening to all of that and got a guitar at the age of six, the age of eight, got into drums. And then that was kind of me, you know, and I just kind of, uh, that was my life, Achi, you know. Uh, as I mentioned to you in the in the message, it was my ilah. So um, yeah, music was ilah everything. meaning it was a thing that you worshipped. For those who don't understand, uh, yeah, it's a thing that I I worshipped. You know, my my happiness, my sadness, my uh, you know my hopes were were built upon that. You see, so um, yeah, I was um, I got into to uh, drumming and uh, started performing like from the age of 11, 12. and then I got accepted into a music college. Uh, in in London at the age of sixteen, and uh, that's where I knew Adele from. Um, and when I when I graduated there, I was going to go off to do um, to study music, uh, to study jazz. And then um, she basically messaged me and said, "Do you want to kind of play?" You know. Uh, so you studied at the same at the as the same music school as her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she was the year above me. So okay, okay. Um, yeah. She messaged me and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm down. So I canceled my, my uni stuff. And that was when she first <laughs> moved. So it was a promotional, her first promotional tour. And we were kind of um, playing on like Jules Holland, Jonathan Ross, went to France, uh, different radio shows, um, went up to, you know, different venues around England. And um, yeah, and I played on the, the first album, 19. And then it kind of ended quite abruptly. I was 19 myself at the time. Mm. And, uh, you know, the manager just called me, up, called me up and was like, yeah, sorry, it's, it's not going to work. So, um, yeah, just cut me off like that. Didn't have what, what, what was the reason for cutting you off? Uh, I think it was to do with maybe I was a bit young, a bit maybe um, thought I was a bit too young and inexperienced. Do you get it? Even though, even though you'd been on tour? Even though I've been on tour and I've been studying it, um, it wasn't maybe it wasn't the image they wanted for the for the band. Alon was best, but he just cut me off. Like he knew I he, I cancelled all my uni, didn't have another job. So that showed me the first kind of cutthroat uh, aspect of the music industry. You see, she left you hanging. Just left me hanging. Yeah. So that's that's how it is a lot of the times. You know, you go you you, you see this uh, a lot in the music industry. Um, this kind of cutthroat, kind of shark-like behavior, um, and then after that, um, I kind of put my put me put my own kind of music collective together in uh, in South London, based in South London, um, mm-hmm. around like Brixton um, area, and we started to become more successful. Um, we were recording, we started being played on like one extra, um, and also we were very uh, close with uh, someone called Katie B who who blew up in, in those times like 2010 2011 okay. and she was part of the collective and then we uh, went on tour we became her band went on tour with a couple of tours with her played mm-hmm. you know, on different radio shows tv sh- shows so we kind of got a good taste of the 
that life, Achi, you know. Um, and the more kind of success I saw, uh, the more problems socially I came into, you know, mm -hmm. um, socially dysfunctional people, uh, you know, kind of jealousy, hasad, um, uh -huh. you know, just, just, Achi, well, I just, you know, if, if you've ever been in uh, amongst like talented musicians, you'll see how yeah. socially dysfunctional people are. You know, I have, I have, because back in Jahili, I used to always also be in music, and we had our own recording studio, and so a lot of people that kind of blew up now. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with like these guys. These kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. So they 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 used they used to be in our studio, um, and uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I think we did a show. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, so I I I, re I really understand what you mean about socially dysfunctional. Like they don't turn up on time, they don't keep the commitments, paranoid, high, always concerned about just into literally. You know, this is sex, drugs, rock and roll. They couldn't have actually captured it better. That's literally what it comes down to. With the so, so you were having issues with these people. Okay, it was just like that. That was kind of all I knew, you know, um, and. Obviously, when you don't have a criterion for like right and wrong, um, anything kind of goes. So people do outlandish things like on a regular basis and, you know, you're just still chilling with them. And, uh, you know, there's no there's no criterion to deal to know how to walk in life, you see. Uh -huh. So the more you and it's just a constant roller coaster of like um, chasing shahawat, you know, chasing desires. And, um, uh, you know, day to day is like uh, it's like you're, you're chasing that high. You see. Uh -huh. So, um, and and that catches up with you, you know, because you're just ultimately putting all of your eggs into into a feeling, you know, into catching that high. So, what what what, what was that feeling? Your what was that feeling you were looking at that you were chasing after? Like, what was if you could? Is it something just abstract, or was there something that represented it? Like, was it money? Was it women? Like, was it success? Was it being number one in the charts? What was it that you were actually trying to run after? You see, at the be at the beginning, Achi, um, because uh, we were really into like this whole conscious, uh, conscious Rap. music or so, so called conscious, you know, hip hop yeah. or, or, or um, uh, whatever it may be, you know, with like a, let's say a political message. Um, that's yeah. that's an illusion in itself, you know. That's another topic. But um, so it starts out like you think you're doing something, um, uh, good, you know, you think you can change the world. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you, you can change society with your. You 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 think you're that you think you're gonna be that seed that Tupac sparked. You know he said, if I can't change the world, but I can spark the seed in the mind that changes it. hundred percent, Achi. It's like almost <laughs> delusions of grandeur you have. You see, and then and then obviously now when you get into it and you see like Subhanallah with these sharks around like record execs, Sony, BMG, EMI, and then, and you know and they st they start to show interest then obviously like things change, you see, like um, yeah. the money comes in. Um, That's what you want down the message, message now. now. Yeah, like, oh, you're, you're a bit too fat, so you need to lose some pounds, you know, because you won't look good on the album cover. And just a lot of things start coming in and people, you, you I literally saw people like change, you know, you know, free, 360, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll start out with this, this kind of, let's say pure, uh, as much as that can be within that within that way of life, idea of you know giving a positive message, and then things change, Achi, You know, because money, you know, position it, it can corrupt if you're not Absolutely. on the right kind of path. You see? Absolutely, Absolutely. So, Achi, so, what are what are some of the evils that you saw in this industry? Like, you know, because we have a lot of brothers and sisters nowadays that listen to music and they think music is permissible, um, like. What what I mean, we can talk a bit about the textual evidences that come with regards to the prohibition of music in a second. That's obviously primary, but I think people would want to hear from, you know, like someone like you, who music was your life. You know, you mentioned to me before the podcast that you'd be, you know, practicing drums five hours a day since you were like seven eight years old. Now this is a massive part of your life, and you managed to overcome it. And then you got a couple of brothers and sisters. You got Aisha, you got Abdullah, that you know they just can't give it up. They're addicted to it. You know what I'm saying? So, no one were other harms. Number two, what is it that allowed you and helped you to ultimately give it up and just overcome it? No, um, Yeah, um, as you as you mentioned, that the primary, the primary, the bottom line is the ahkam, the hukum shari of the mm. of, of 
of music, you know, from a Shari'i perspective. But uh, I 100% um, saw, I think one of the most profound things for me about the harms of music is just its power, you know, the way it can change your heart, change your qalb. It can, it can make you do, it can, it can incite feelings and desires in you or uh, change your mood. Um, <clears throat> uh, it can take you to places that are not normal, you see. Um, I used to, we used to play in like jam sessions for hours. They call them jam sessions, like yeah, open mic nights and things like that. You'd just be playing for, for hours at a time. And, and obviously they, you mix that with the, with the weed and everything else. You go to strange places, Akhi. And uh, this is why you see throughout, throughout um, history and cross-culturally, melody and rhythm is synonymous with, with like sihr and invoking the shayateen and the jinn and um, shamanistic rituals. And, you know, when you're a musician, you go deep into music, it, you, it takes you to weird places, bro. You know, and you do, you, you, there, there'll be times where I'll be playing and it's like, this is not from me, you see. So you actually, you, you actually, so you're saying, so you actually felt like this was from shaitan. As in, what was coming yeah. out? I mean, now as a Muslim, knowing about Al Ghaib and uh, the world of the, the Shatin and stuff like that, I can I can think back and, and know yeah that that's the interference there. Yeah. But Shaykh, you know this it, it's in, it's interesting you say that because you know in the Quran Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said wafstaf ziz manista ta'ta minhum bi sautik. Allah says to Shaytan, incite whoever it is that you want with your voice, try and terrorize whoever it is that you want with your voice. Fir Salaf, the Sahaba and their students, they explained the ayah. It was, I think it was either Ibn Abbas or Mujahid Ibn Jabrin, who was a student of Ibn Abbas, one of the two. But they mentioned that the, the, the speech of Shaytan here, because Allah said to Shaytan, in, you know, try to you know, mess up whoever you want you with your voice. They said the speech of Shaytan here is music. So what, pe what, what people don't actually realize is that, you know, when they're listening to music again and again and again, they actually are fully given their ear up to Iblis. They're fully given it up to him. And then they and then they wonder why they're not able to listen to the Quran, which is a speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, it reminds me of the statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said that uh uh al qalb and nifaq. He said that music inherits inside of the heart hypocrisy. And when you look at the hypocrites, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us about them that they, you know they they were just not able to listen to the Quran. Whatever they did, they just they just could not listen to the Quran. Uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them if a surah was to come down they would look around at each other thumman sarafu then they would depart and when they would depart saraf Allah quloobahum Allah would then so they would turn away the surah came down they would turn away from the surah they would walk away Allah says saraf Allah quloobahum Allah then turned their hearts away and you know you ask these brothers these sisters who try to justify music I just asked them one thing like bro can you listen to the speech of Allah more than the Quran so then, 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 then the music, if you can't listen to the Quran for long periods of time without getting frustrated, that is a sign that you are really under, you know, some kind of, you know, devil-like uh, influence, some, some satanic influence. Um, either that or hypocrisy is starting to enter into your heart because, you know, people can say, oh, it's permissible. But then Allah gave us a diagnostic test to see what the characteristics of a hypocrite are and what aren't. So when you look at the hypocrites, for example, they can't listen to the Quran, they can't pray, they're lazy when it comes to the Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you know, وَإِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَامُوا kusala." When they stand up for the prayer, they stand up lazy. And they really only stand up so people can see, so you can show people, yo, look, I'm praying. I'm, you know, you're not really doing it for the sake of Allah, but just to show off. You know, if you find that, if you find keeping your deeds private is hard, you know, even when it comes to charity. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا لا تُبْتِلُوا صَدَقَاتِكُمْ بِالْمَنِّ وَالْأَذَى كَالَّذِي يُنْفِقُ مَا لَهُ رِئَاءَ النَّاسِ you know, given charity, but then you have to tell people, hey, look what I did today. You know, every time you do a good deed, you remind people, bro, you know, you remember what I did for you? Remember what I did for you? I gave charity. Like, these are all things that hypocrites would do. Obviously, there's an exhaustive list, and I'm not going into it. But the point is that, you know, these are some key things, you know, like not being able to listen to the Quran, not being able to pray or being lazy when it comes to salah, you know, showing off a lot, especially with your good deeds and your, you know, your charity and whatnot. If if this resonates with you and you also listen to music, then there's then then then, then there's your problem. And now you know what the problem is. 
Do you know what I'm saying? So, so you we can you can talk about oh, where's the evidence? And we're talk, to be honest, it, 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 it amazes me that people have a discussion on the evidences. The evidences are so clear. There's five ayat from the Quran. There's 14 ahadith from the Sunnah, and there's unanimous consensus from the companions as well and the Salaf al-Salih. But people still try to play around with it. But I'm saying even if you was to just not have that discussion about the evidences, which we'll come to in a second, just to know how much of an effect it has on you. Like, bro, this is hypocrisy. It is what how the hypocrites were. If you if you struggle to listen to the Quran, if you struggle to stand up and pray, bro, that's a sign that you are that, you know that the music is having a bad effect on you. Hundred percent, Akhi. And uh, you know, I've had personal experience where whereby someone would start out knowing the the hukum and accepting <coughs> that, and um, and then time goes by, people maybe they they kind of uh, fall into things or they they their iman gets a bit weak. And then, you know, they're not they're not as attached to the masjid as they were before, or they're they're delaying the salah, or they're missing the salah here and there. So they start out knowing the haq, and then they the iman goes down, and it's often attached to the salah. To be honest with you, everything mm. is is usually attached to the salah when, when people go off off the off the path, you know. Um, and then the hukum for them changes. That I've seen this happen with with a few different uh, people. May Allah guide us and, and them. The, the hukum mean. changes after the iman drops, you see. Mm. So they're now trying to justify the, the, the permissibility of music um, after they've gone through some, some things and their iman, you know, has not been in the best place. So, um, and I've seen that uh, personally, you know, the hadith where um, the, 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 this is the main, the main, um, the main dalil for music being impermissible, you know, yastahilun al ma'azif. Naam, yastahilun al-hira wal harir. Uh, um, uh, they will try to make halal They will become a people in my ummah That will try to make music Or musical instruments Alcohol, fornication And silk halal Naam. Exactly, yeah So in, in this In the in yastahilun Al-ma'azif Yastahilun It has alif, sin and ta In the verb so if you know about Arabic, you know that this is this shows talab. It shows to, to request to speak. You see. Oh wow! Um, it, it, it's to seek to make it permissible. So wow! I had a, a good, uh, yeah, I understand. So I saw the. I got. A, I did a little video about this, but I saw the, the fruition of this from a brother that I was very close with firsthand. You know, started out upon um, upon clear understanding, guidance. In fact, before he even became Muslim, he was coming up to me. He was coming to me saying, bro, like this music thing, you know, I just feel to get rid of all my keyboards and just destroy everything. And da, da, da. I was like, bro, like st step at a time, like but take the Shahada first, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, uh, and then he was practicing uh, for, for a while. Certain things happened. And then slowly but surely his his kalam started to change towards music because he became uh, he went through some things. He became a bit a bit weak in his Iman. Um, he was finding it hard to uh, to kind of be practicing the dean, and you know, when when all you've known is music and making money from music, it can be that can be a big test, and the was worse the shaitan could come. Oh yeah, absolutely. But step by step, uh, he made music permissible for himself, and it's mm -hmm. amazing that, uh, that uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he uses this word ta, you know, to seek to make it permissible, and he even told me himself, bro. You know, things are hard at the moment. I've just been trying to find uh, any way to make music permissible for myself. But I knew oh, wow. to myself, you know, that was the first stage. He knew he, it was it was about it. And then step by step, it then the, the, the last the last the last uh, product of this of this path was, you know, bro, music's a very um, it's a very uh, common thing worldwide cross-culturally you know everyone does it you know you know some you know i'm just not sure some of these uh these um these fatawa resonate with me you know um there's more than one opinion so it's like i literally saw the the chain mm. of events that took him to yeah. to make it permissible now you know so it was it was amazing actually because sadaqa rasulullah sallallahu Muhammad spoke the truth. Imagine the, the, the detailed word of, of uh, how specific it is and how people follow that. No. They start um, 
fall fall back on their ibadat or their adhkar or their you know their their protection. Well, I, and, and, and you know, no no barakallah And just in case anyone, because um, I know some people have a have a thing about the authenticity of this narration. Number one is definitely sahih in Imam al Bukhari. Uh, but you know, to try and explain that to people sometimes can be a bit nuanced for those who don't understand the technicalities of how Imam al Bukhari authored his Sahih. Uh, for those who do understand, he narrated it Bisirat al Jazm, which is Sahih. Uh, according to Imam al Bukhari, for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry, it's the, the same narration is in Sunan Abi Dawood. Uh, Imam al Bayhaqi also narrated it with its complete chains of narrations. Imam ibn Hajar al Asqalani has a kitab called Ta'liq al Taghliq. Uh, in which he brings the the uh, these kind of narrations from Al Bukhari, and he shows that they have been connected in other places. So it's even if you even if you do want to talk about Al Bukhari, which is very embarrassing for you because Imam Bukhari was a beast and a giant, and he knew this world better than you. And people have tried for centuries to try to critique Sahih the Sahih Imam Bukhari, and they've fallen flat on their face every time. But even if you were Imam Al Bukhari, took these such narrations that are called Mu'allaqat and he showed how they were authentic. And connected from all these different different other places. So this narration is authentic. La matanafi. There's no criticism of it. And if you wanted to even not accept that, there's another 13 narrations that are standing there as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is. I think this is what Ibn Hajar Asqalani mentioned that there's 13 uh, asanid to yeah. this to this hadith. So it's like, yeah, it's 100 percent sahih. You see. Yeah. Um, even you know, there's there's an ayah in the Quran that's really profound. Then I, it, what's shocking is that a lot of people have probably heard it, memorized it. Uh, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He mentioned, "Afamin uh, al hadithi ta'jabun." Do you find this revelation astonishing? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Do you find this revelation astonishing?" Afamin al hadithi ta'jabun. Then Allah said, "Wa hakuna wa la tabkun." You are laughing, but you're not crying. The Quran, you're hearing it. We're hearing the Quran. But you're playing around. You're laughing and you're not crying. Rather, what are you doing? What does Samidun mean? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, who was the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who the Prophet made dua for him to, for Allah to teach him the interpretation of the Quran. He said, and he was an Arab, and he said, Samidun means al ghina if I'm not mistaken, I think he said ghina, which is singing. So it means it means singing. Um, so al ghina, uh, he said this is according to the Himyari dialect of the Arabs. So Samidun is referring to singing here. So Allah said, look at this. Is is it this? Do you find this revelation, this Quran, astonishing? You laugh and you do not cry. All these verses about hellfire and the day of judgment and the stories of what happened to the nations of old who disobeyed and it's not making you cry, okay? In in fact, you sing, you dance, you joke, you club, you drink, you smoke, you're, you're playing around. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're making music, you're singing. And then look what Allah said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا Allah said, Rafa, Allah said, worship Allah, make sujood to Him. Make sujood to him and worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. You know what's shocking is that this ayah, when the Quraysh heard this verse, who are kuffar, who are enemies of the Prophet Islam, persecuting the Prophet Islam and his companions, this was so powerful, this was so powerful that they all fell into sujood. All of them fell on their faces into sajda. They all fell into sujood. I'm saying these are kuffar, and Muslims will hear it, and they will stay say, yeah, but my sheikh said. And they'll carry on with it. Afran, sorry, I went on a bit of a rant there. I'd like to do a lot more, but um, I have to, I have to start working 15 minutes. But yeah, inshallah. Um, Should we go to the to, to, to the to this, your your journey with regards to you from Judaism? Do you, what do you think, or should we carry on with the music? Okay. Um. Well, yeah. Basically, it's kind of it kind of gets a, a bit interrelated when uh, further towards me coming towards Islam. Um, because you know, I mentioned that um, my kind of our collective was getting more uh, successful, um, and the more success and the more, the more uh, you know clubs, nights, kind of raving that that was going on with, with the with the band and everything that comes with that. Uh, the more and more, I just started to feel more uh, disenfranchised with with that whole way of life. 
you see. And uh, okay. another thing we had in our collective, we had lots of different um, people from different backgrounds. So we had um, <clears throat> like the MC was from like a like a kind of Rasta background from his mm. uh, from his mother and father. Um, and uh, then we had someone from like a Catholic background. We had like a Somali brother around us um, who's obviously from a Muslim background. And, and, and then I was from a kind of Jewish background. So I saw certain people, there was a certain time where people were trying, were becoming a bit more, um, on this, uh, you know, this righteous thing, as they say, you know, like uh, the producer was starting to grow out his beard and stuff because he's like on this eye tag you know, uh, just eat natural foods and, you know, uh, it's with a lot of um, Rastafarians up in West London, you know, um, Labrook Grove in these places. Uh, and then, um, yeah, that kind of affected the the, um, the the rapper as well. And and then the, the Somali brother started practicing as well. So he kind of kind of cut off from us a bit. So everyone was kind of on a kind of trying Spiritual to find journey. a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then there was me. I was like, okay. And, you know, uh, something profound happened actually before all of that, because before I didn't really think about uh, Allah, I didn't think about God or a creator. I didn't I just wasn't really in that in that place. You know, I had all the cultural things and uh, X, Y, Z, but I wasn't um, pondering over those deeper questions, you see. But then once a few things happened, I remember once I was watching a, a documentary about uh, it's called The Secret Life of Chaos on the BBC about how. Uh, there's patterns in nature and they all kind of correlate. So even the patterns of the stars and the, the, the way a leaf will grow and the, the arteries in a body and the, 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 way, the way the tribute trees in a river uh, branch oh, wow. out. And I, I remember seeing that. And I remember after that finished for the first time, I was like, there's got to be a creator, you know, there, oh, wow. that, that's too much detail. That's, that's like a clear sign, you know? So that was the first stage for me, you know, and then I wanted to kind of attach that now to my Jewish roots so uh, then I went to get like a um, like a translation of the Torah uh, from um, what, like Waterstone's bookshop or something like that. So I wanted mm -hmm. to start reading that, um, and I started reading that, but it just, it didn't resonate at all uh, with me. It wasn't resonating. So just like Genesis, Leviticus, all that like those. Yeah, it kind of read to me just like a kind of history textbook, you see. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of put that on the shelf. <laughs> uh, carried on with my life it became even more dark um dysfunctional there's a lot of um social issues that happen because of the um playing for the keb band and we had our own music collective thing we wanted to put out tracks and the um and there was a, a beef between the keb uh management and our kind of our music collective and that went just horribly wrong um it was very messy uh, that affected me. I saw other people just, just um, you know, just turning up wasted, you know, at the, uh, you know, at, at shows, in the band, coming late, you know, just uh, as you as you know, dysfunctional behavior, and um, I just felt very, you know, I remember I, I was I, I felt kind of lost. You see, I remember coming back one day from a show and I, I opened up to a friend. I was like, you know, I don't know who I am. You know, I felt like I don't know who I am. You see, because everyone in the music scene is trying to build this like uh, identity around themselves, you know, with the image of the musician or the, the, <coughs> the, the click that you're in. And this is not the reality of, of each individual person. This is this is a delusion, you see. And I, I felt I was doing that. So I felt lost, Achi, you know, but this is the time when we were kind of blowing, you know. Russ Kwame was playing us on one extra. We were getting headlining shows around um, uh, Brixton in the clubs in Brixton. But it was just a miserable time for me, Achi, you know. And people were changing because of the, the record deals and the, the money that was coming in. And that was obvious to me, you see. So I felt like I was, uh, I felt kind of I was going against my principles, or what principles I thought I had. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a rough time. And then previous to that, uh, this brother, um, the Somali brother who I who I used to work with, who I who was kind of around the band, he he gave me a translation of the Quran, um, and at that time I kind of left it on the bookshelf, but um, yeah, he he that was actually quite profound because he came back from Hajj, uh, the first time that I was kind of really uh, kind of uh, impressed by uh, a Muslim was when I saw him come back from Hajj, you know, because before that he was like. 
you know, um, kind of a, a bit street, like swearing. The Somali was not that a bit hyped, yeah. And then after Hadji was like calm, white fold, oh, didn't up. swear. And I was like, I like the way this brother's changed, man. I you know, that. I really yeah. like and I wanted to be around him. And I was Jahil at that time, you know, um, and doing up to everything that I was up to, but I liked being around him, you know. I preferred being, I preferred him like that than being like the hype guy, you know. Mm. Um, so um that really affected me. I really liked what I saw. You know, it's like he had no to be honest with you, he hadn't like no oh, around him. Um, and then um, just seeing the brotherhood around uh, Brixton as well, like the Moroccans and the Somalis and the Pakistanis, everyone giving salam to each other, all from different backgrounds, but all like one brotherhood. You know, even the oh, people that weren't practicing, I feel like there's something different about, about this. Oh, you know? oh, yeah. Um, yeah, he gave me this Quran and it was when I was most, uh, <coughs> when I was most at my lowest point, uh, I didn't want to do anything that day. I was in my flat. I woke up and I saw the Quran that he, he, he I saw the. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Oh, I, I always choke at this part of the story. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. Yeah, so Alhamdulillah. I picked it up and, you know, that was it, Akhi. Surah Al Fatiha, Surah Al Baqarah. I was like, just hit me, bro. Subhanallah. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's touching me the way, like, it means this moment is the moment in which you started to feel that guidance into your heart, right? So, it's touching me because how many times, I mean, you see, we're born Muslim, right? Many of us, most of us. And uh, I don't think we appreciate the gift of guidance the way. The way you're showing, you know, your appreciation to Allah for it. Without this guidance, well, that is nothing. There is no, there is nothing greater than being able to have the guidance to worship Allah alone and to follow His Messenger Sunnah, which will give you eternal ecstasy in paradise. But wallahi, it just shows, Subhanallah, that we are not grateful. Barakallah for this reminder, Akhi. Barakallahu feek. Barakallahu feek. Ameen. Jazakallahu khair, akhi. Inshallah. Inshallah, we can do this again, inshallah. Inshallah, akhi, definitely. And we definitely have to see each other in the flesh, akhi. You know, I, I just want to mention one thing, inshallah, before we conclude, just based on what you just said now. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us, He sent down the Quran to us. Yeah, it's the speech of Allah. And it's, 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 you know, the Quran, you know, the people who, who dive into it to Allah, they find a sweetness and joy, the likes of which you just can't experience, like it can't be, it, it cannot be expressed like when you have you know you know when you listen to a track and the lyrics are just amazing and the guys number one he's flowing number two what he's saying is touching your heart the word play is serious and it's just resonant you're just you know you feel in the zone and obviously you have to have a degree of intelligence and a degree of charisma and a degree of eloquence to be able to put that kind of uh that word play together right but I can now imagine engaging to the speech of the King of Kings, the one whose speech is most perfect, the one whose speech is most eloquent, the one who's most knowledgeable, most wise. You know that that speech when you dive into the when you listen to the Quran like that, Wallah is resonating with you on levels that are unimaginable. Hundred percent. But the issue is we don't understand it, and you know what we do instead of trying to understand it, 
we do as the people, as the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, the Ahlul Kitab did. We take the Quran, we throw it over our backs. We throw it over our backs and we turn towards music. And it reminds me of uh, an incident from the time of Musa alayhi salam. Moses, you know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَأَنزَلْنَا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sent down upon the manna was salwa. He sent down to them this food, manna and salwa. So this was heaven sent food. Um, but the thing is, this heaven sent food that was sent to them, they got bored of it one day. So, وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَى they, One day Allah said, remember when, when, they, when they said to Musa, لَن نَصْبِرَ عَلَىٰ طَعَامٍ وَاحِدٍ They said, Musa, we're eating one thing every day. We can't take this. You know, it's, it's, we can't be patient with one thing. فَدْعُ لَنَا رَبَّكَ يُخْرِجْ لَنَا مِمَّا تُنْبِتُ الْأَرْضُ مِنْ بَقَلِهَا وَقِثَائِهَا وَفُومِهَا وَعَدَسِهَا وَبَصَلِهَا They said, make dua to Allah to bring us food from the earth. You know, the, 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 the onions and everything. Like we, we want that food that comes out of the earth. So pay attention, Allah sent them food that came from the sky But they wanted to They, 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 they got bored of the heaven sent food And they wanted food that come out of the low earth So Musa looked at them He said قل, He said He said You want to exchange something low for something that was better And wallahi this is exactly what the Muslims have done with the Quran Allah sent us something great from above The way he sent them food from above He sent us his speech from above And we want to exchange And leave off the Quran We're bored of it For the speech of A stripper Cardi B A drug dealer A crackhead A fornicator Prostitute Fraudster Alcoholic, not just not just kufar, but the lowest of them, aradil, that like you know what I'm saying, like guys who, wallahi, there's 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 no there's no honor for them, you know what I'm saying, and we literally left the speech of Allah for that, you know, and there's consequences for that. Yes. Okay, okay, uh, I'm really sorry, but I have to. Now, barakallahu Thank you so much. I, I think I couldn't have I couldn't have requested for a more appropriate ending to this. Jazakallah khaira. I really appreciate you taking out the time. We definitely, inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll do another session. And you know, we do regular umrah trips to uh to uh, Mecca and Medina. Corona thing shut it down, but next time you're in Riyadh, right? But we've got to try and find a way. We've got to f- definitely akhi, definitely akhi, definitely akhi. May Allah honor you for dunya wal akhirah, you and your family, your loved ones, everyone. Ask Allah to guide your family members. Ameen. Ameen. Hayakallah, Habib. You take care of yourself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Shadu la ilaha illa anta staghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum, guys. I want you to meet Johnny. Johnny is a key member of our team. With the permission of Allah, he's responsible for the recording, the editing, and the uploading of almost every single bit of content that you see on the YouTube channel. Now, that's a beautiful task, but behind it, there is a bit of a sad story, and that is that Johnny's overworked. Right now, it's way past hours. It's 8 p.m. at night, and he's probably gonna be here for a few more hours. And he's been here since 7 a.m. in the morning. And this is sad to say a normal day. Because in order for us to be able to reach our targets and to get the content out to you so that we can produce what we can every day to ensure that that will reach who it needs to reach, the team needs to work this hard. The reality of the matter is that this is not sustainable long term. Johnny is going to burn out. Johnny's going to give up. And when that happens, the da'wah is unfortunately going to be affected. I need you guys to be able to help Johnny. Help him how? We need a bigger team. We need more graphic designers. We need more editors. We need more cameramen to help us sustain what we're doing now and so that we can do more. But that all requires funding. And that's where you come in. You see in the da'wah, everyone has a role to play. Don't think that it's just my job or Johnny's job. I have something to share 
in terms of what little knowledge I've acquired, and that's my job. Johnny has the skills, and that's his job. But in order to make this operation run, for us to hire the people with the skill set to be able to do what they're doing, that's where you come in. The ones who may not have that skill, who may not have the ability to give the da'wah, but they do have the ability to fund it to allow the da'wah to manifest. So in essence, when I'm asking you to help Johnny, I'm asking you to help yourself. Because this is you fulfilling your responsibility so that you can get that reward in the day of judgment. So help Johnny by helping yourself, by donating as generously as you can at the link below. Peace.